Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Share Screen Africa's Raptor Education Series. Um, it's so great to see all your, uh, or some of our, um, or uh, sorry, our, our, to see you all tonight. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to con concentrate on more than one screen here. <laughs> it's good to see you all um, tonight again for this amazing series. Uh, tonight we have an extra special. Uh, surprise for you all we are going to be speaking to two of the most mm -hmm. um, su successful and also the most fascinating bi raptor biologists that i've had the pleasure of uh, meeting and working with um, joining us all the way from austria and that's going to be professor petra sumas goodner and dr shane mcpherson they're going to be speaking to us uh, about raptors in urban spaces which is absolutely for me absolutely fascinating and um it holds a special place in my heart of course um after we chat to them about their experiences with urban uh, birds of prey we're going to pop over and chat to another researcher kaka carlson who's going to talk to us a little bit about her experience with um with raptors in urban spaces thereafter heading all the way back down to east africa to visit with Washington Washira, a, a researcher that we've we've had a chat with earlier in the series, who's going to also be interviewing um, our resident raptor specialist uh, Simon Tomset to talk about urban um, urban birds in Kenya. Of course, everyone, um, as uh, as we do every um, every series or every episode. Uh, during the course of the session, we're going to send out some of those educational posters raptor educational posters to the to the email that you use to register for tonight's talk so please again i would like to encourage you all as soon as you get it to share those posters far and wide use all your social media facebook instagram linkedin twitter wherever you can uh, get those posters out there and start spreading the word about conservation of africa's raptors remember those posters are completely copyright free so you can print them and share them as much as you like um and if you have missed any of those posters of course from our previous uh, uh sessions or episodes rather you are welcome to jump onto knav conservation foundation's facebook page and download them from there just like our other talks as well, if there's any talks that you've missed or talks that you would like to re-watch, you're welcome to visit sharescreenafrica.org and visit their uh, their events page and go through all the past talks and watch them in your um, in, the, uh, in the comfort of your own home um, and at your own time. So you're welcome to do that at any period. You can also jump on Share, uh, Share Screen Africa's YouTube channel where you'll find them all there. Um, this uh, this this uh, See, or this episode is also being recorded so um it and will be available uh, at a later at a later stage on share screen africa as well and with that i would like you i'd like to introduce you guys to our two headline speakers for tonight um prof Petra Sumskudna and Shane McPherson. Petra um is a phenomenal researcher that uh, after completing her phd there they are after the completing a PhD uh, through the, uh, the Viennese Kestrel project, uh, went on to work as a postdoc in northern Finland and South Africa, focusing on urban raptor ecology. Shane McPherson, uh, who is also a dedicated biologist with a wide range of interests in, in the natural world, has a true passion that lies with African crowned eagles, um, a man after my own heart, of course. Uh, through the through the use of advanced technology such as cameras and GPS tracking, Shane has been able to collect valuable data that has raised awareness and uh, dispelled misconceptions about urban crowned eagles, fostering conservation efforts and promoting coexistence with the impressive with these impressive um, predators. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you both to Petra and Shane. Over to you guys. The floor is yours. Hello. I hope you can all hear us well. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction, Kaylin. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so urban raptors, warriors of the sky and the raptors and birds of prey that are around us was the topic that we were tasked to put together for you. And it's been really a passion of ours for the last decade, or in Shane's case, even 15 years. And I think it's um, not to be denied now that urbanization is all around us. We are well aware of it. 
And this is a map from NASA about the artificial light at night, the light pollution that we are all encountering on a daily basis. And it also shows us where large urban areas are actually located. So we do have a bias towards the Northern Hemisphere when it comes down to really big cities. But of course, lots of urbanization is happening in Africa and actually happening at a faster rate than elsewhere together with Asia as well. So it's very important that we keep an eye on how urbanization is affecting our wildlife. And for us, predators and raptor experts, that's really what has been driving our work over the last time. Then I also wanted to highlight a little BBC series that you for sure have heard about, Planet Earth 2. I will not pretend that I'm as good as a presenter at David Edinburgh, but I'm truly um, inspired by him. Because what I really enjoyed about the second series was, it was the first one where urban environments were actually dedicated as an entire new ecosystem. They had a whole series just on that, and they were highlighting urban environments across the globe and the wildlife interactions with humans. And that was quite inspiring because it was one of the first where this really happened. So when we think about raptors, why do they go into urban environments? I think that's a question that is quite important and also one that we always ask the wrong way around because it's not them coming back into urban environments. It's some species that manage to stay, that persist when we are building cities. So they are becoming our neighbors and they are right at our doorstep and offer really a lot of opportunities for observations and for getting up close with large predators even. So when we think about how they can persist, it's mainly linked to resources. Something is there in the city that they need to live. And one of that is food and the other one is nesting sites. And their anthropogenic structures can be quite important. So when we think about food, it might be really deliberate food, like supplementary feeding, bird feeders. And we are not feeding raptors directly, at least only in rare occasions. But we might create a biodiversity of potential prey species for these raptors. And that also means that sometimes we have a true accumulation of avian prey mainly, and also rodents and so on in cities that raptors can, of course, prey, so prey on. So there is a large biomass there. And we humans are also meat consumers. So there are slaughterhouses and um, thereof, and raptors use those to scavenge, for example. So that's also a reason why raptors might be in the city. And when it comes down to nesting structures, we build infrastructure. We build platforms that might be used by raptors. It can be on purpose, these nest platforms, but it might also be that they just take advantage of the situation. And that could be power lines or pylons. That could also be large exotic trees, like with the example here of the black sparrow hooks. So all of that might be a reason why raptors can stay in urban environments, even if it is the purpose only for a city to actually host humans. And we've both been working in South Africa on, on quite different projects. And uh, here you've got a combination of skyline of Cape Town, Johannesburg and Durban. Um, urban environments are quite complex environments with um, quite small, often small um, green spaces and parklands and things like that. And so um, with a meta-analysis um, by one of Petra's students, uh, we can see that um, more often smaller raptors are able to adapt and thrive in urban environments. And uh, you'll see throughout the world species like the peregrine and the black kite um, but in South Africa and Africa, you'll get um, black-shouldered kites and black sparrowhawks. Um, the counterparts in, in Europe and America include sharp-shinned hawks and goshawks. Um, but in Africa especially, there's also um, some very large species that can thrive in urban environments, especially um, where cities are located next to rivers and coasts. The, uh, the African fish eagle is one of those iconic species. So we will mainly be introducing you to four 
species because these are the ones that we know the most about because these are the ones that we have been working with. But they also give a very nice spectrum about that. So Shane just mentioned the surprise of large predators in cities in, on the African continent, which is truly unique. There are not many examples for that elsewhere. And I think the crowned eagle is not only for that reason, but one of the many reasons why so many people are impressed by them. But then there are also the classic small ones like the kestrel, black sparrow hawk, or the peregrine falcon. And what you can see on that slide now as well are just the typical prey resources that they are using when they are in urban environments. So there are rodents that many of them really like. Then lots of them are pigeon hunters or dove hunters, which is also a reason why they can. Um, have very large population sizes in urban environments and crowned eagles for example take also advantage of the monkeys that are going into cities in large troops I mean they are a true monkey eating species and that's a reason why they can sustain in the city as well and when it comes down to the nesting sites we also have this great variety there are some that are breeding on buildings in um, building cavities or even in nest boxes and then there are some that are using these large exotic trees that I mentioned, like pine trees or eucalyptus trees that are not supposed to be there when it comes down to the natural ecosystem, but um, humans have planted them and the raptors are using them. So as I said, I will mainly introduce you to these three here. And um, one advantage of these systems is that we have coloring them. So we know a lot about them on an individual basis. I can tell you the age of them or if they have been paired for a long time with the same partner or if they, if they have rather been switching. But we also have GPS tags on some of them and the GPS, everybody knows this by now, every phone has a GPS as well. They will tell us where an animal is and when it is there. So we have a location and a timestamp and with that we can learn a great deal about their life in the city. So I want to start with the most iconic of them all, the most powerful raptor, which is the Eurasian kestrel, a true African. And I was just waiting for Shane to complain about that, but apparently he doesn't. He just gave up on me. He's the eagle guy. I love my little kestrels because they are so wonderful. And yes, we are tasked about talking African raptors, and now I introduce you to a true European. But that's again the wrong way to think about it because they are migratory and they just spent their summer in Europe. And the rest of the year, they are migrating into other areas like North, America, uh, North Africa. And with that, they become a true African when you think about it. So they just follow the same movements as Shane and I do pretty much that they are spending the endless summer in Europe and then on the African continent. What is also very interesting about these little kestrels, they're very charming and charismatic, as you can see on these photos, but they are very diverse in where they are nesting. They are going in building cavities and they really squeeze in an entire family in these little cavities. But if there are no cavities on a building, they just go into planters, so window boxes, and they are breeding there, which is a nice substrate for them to lay eggs in. And then they are living in there and raising their young just directly in front of your window, basically. They are also eating a diverse diet in the city, a bit different than what you would expect in the countryside. So in the countryside, they are mainly eating voles, diurnal species. You can see it here on this picture with tiny eyes and tiny ears. So clearly a, a diurnal species that is living in bright sunlight, easy to catch for a kestrel. But in the city, that looks very different. There, they find different rodents, nocturnal ones, and you can see it here in these big eyes and big ears, that they are living in the night and maybe not available for a diurnal raptor, like a kestrel. So they have to become a bit creative and adaptable in what type of prey they are eating, and they become mainly then also bird feeders, for example. So that's something that we see a lot, that they really switch the diet from what is usually a typical raptor menu which is then different in a city environment. And that we can really tell the story across species. So it's not a unique system with the kestrel, it's just an example that we picked here for these diet switches. Then I also wanted to introduce you to the peregrine falcon. That's a true cosmopolitan species. So they are occurring across, across the globe, just not in the Antarctic. And they are breeding also in urban environments. And here, the example with Cape Town, we have a very large peregrine breeding population. And this breeding population has even been increasing over the last few decades. So in the last 30 years, 
you can see a very steady population increase. And that is because humans were helping these species. So they were building nest boxes, specifically in size and location, to be attractive for a peregrine falcon. And that system apparently worked because they were very happy to move into these nest boxes and are using them across the city now as well. And you can see the curve of the population increase very nicely matches actually the curve of the increase in nest boxes. So that's also a reason why we have large population sizes of some raptors, but people just help them because they enjoy having them around. And with the peregrine falcon, it might also be that they enjoy that they are eating the pigeons around their houses and are just keeping these pests a little bit under control. And the last example that I would like to give you before I hand over to Shane again is the black sparrowhawk. That's another species that is very common in urban environments across the African continent. And that's also a species that is actually notoriously hard to work on because they have a crazy long breeding season. So if you want to really monitor all of them, you have to be out all year round pretty much. But this breeding season has also changed a little bit. And that's quite an interesting thing linked to the city because they were not always known to be an urban species. And when we look here on the Afri uh, South African country just, we see that in the past they have only been living in the Northeast, but now they have colonized Cape Town around the 90s. And with this colonization, they have expanded their breeding season. So historically, they have been breeding fairly late in the year. And now in this new environment, they are breeding early. And of course, we wanted to understand why. And we realized that they are encountering a very new competitor in the city. Um, so they are starting to lay their eggs in the nest in a beautiful tree. And they are having their planning to raise their chicks. But then an Egyptian goose comes in and is trying to drive these raptors out. And more often than not, they're actually succeeding. It's simply because the geese are so big and powerful in that way that they can really drive a goshawk, in that case, a black sparrowhawk out of a nest. And because of, of that, there seems to be a link that they are breeding earlier to not overlap with the main breeding season of the geese. So if they breed very early, then there is enough space and time to raise their chicks before the geese are trying to steal the nests. So that's also an example about how the city can change this interspecies interactions, how a new competitor is actually changing the entire life cycle of a raptor species. And maybe unexpected when you think about a goose being the one that is able to dominate over the black sparrowhawk. Yeah, and with this, I really go now to the powerful one, but I will hand over to Shane. He can't wait to tell you what it really looks yeah, like. Yeah, I can't wait to tell you about crowned eagles. Um, yeah, they Simon introduced them as one of the mega eagles of Africa, and they are incredibly powerful. Um, you saw the um, the structure of their tarsal bone and the, the power that goes into their feet and the size of their talons. And uh, yeah, it's really remarkable to see them um, exploiting urban areas. And in particular, for the last 10 years, my work has been focused in Durban. It's a city of 4 million people and one of the largest commercial ports in all of Africa. Um, and you can see here that although they, there are none along the um, central metropolitan area right down by the port, um, the urban sprawl extends a long way inland, and we have at least 34 territories throughout these suburbs. Um, and of those 34 territories, we have um, 66 nest sites. So there's um, sometimes multiple nests and old nests within territories. And uh, so the crowned eagle situation is quite an enigma because um, Generally, the old publications, um, especially the first work from Leslie Brown, uh, in the equatorial regions, crowned eagles breed every second year, and juveniles require 12 to 15 months of support from their parents in order to um, develop the skills necessary to hunt difficult prey like monkeys. And um, in Durban, it was often said that uh, a few of these nest sites breed every year. And that posed a really interesting question, um, uh, something that we wanted to research. Is it because that uh, the juveniles are always getting killed so quickly? 
um, or is there something else going on? And in terms of uh, nest sites, some nests can be used for, um, well, we, the Ronald's Kloof nest here has been known since the 1970s. So 40, 50 years um, occupied, but sometimes we'll see new nests being built within the same territory. And in Durban, we also have um, a conflict and issue to balance between um, ring barking and cutting down eucalypt uh, gum trees, which are prime nest sites for crowned eagles, black sparrowhawks, fish eagles, uh, woolly neck stalks. So these large eucalypt trees are, um, uh, are being removed for restoring river systems, but they're also being used by indigenous um, species and, and raptors and eagles. Um, so in terms of annual breeding, in recent years, it's taken a long time, but recently we've been getting more and more footage of coming springtime, the adults evicting the juvenile, which is not quite one year old. Um, they will be attacking the juvenile whenever it approaches the nest and the nest uh, tree. And you can see different examples here. And uh, then the, the juvenile will have to go off and look for its own food. And what food can it find in the city? We've already seen a photo of monkeys. Uh, in Durban, we've also found that rock hyrax have invaded the urban spaces. And as well as using uh, rockeries and their typical uh, cliff areas, they will often use these storm drains to have um, family groups and colonies. And this sort of situation here in a retirement village is a perfect example of, of a young crowned eagle that will be looking for prey and find a rock hyrax to hunt. Um, but that's not a rock hyrax. That there in that crowned eagle's talons is a dashing dog. It's somebody's pet. So this is one of the big conflicts about crowned eagles in the cities and something that we're um, focusing as much effort as we can on addressing um, what, where, how, why crowned eagles um, uh, are coming into these situations with the residents and creating uh, animosity and trying to solve these problems so that crowned eagles have a long future living in the cities. So um, we wanted to use nest cameras at the crowned eagle nests to record all of the prey types that are being hunted within the city and try and figure out if this, um, this uh, perception that many citizens around the city have is that crowned eagles only survive in the city because they have chickens and cats and dogs to hunt. And so we put up cameras at multiple nest sites and we collected nearly 1 million photos from these camera traps um, covering um, three to five months per nest and getting a really nice um, data set of nearly 1,940 prey items. And we can see here that livestock, including guinea fowl um, and mainly chickens, account for about three to 5% of the prey and pets are, are less than 1% of the prey. Most of the prey in the urban environment is rock hyrax, uh, small antelope like blue diker, and other wildlife, including uh, genets, uh, mongooses, and harida ibis, especially robbing harida ibis nests. Um, harida are also a urban exploiter. But there's no denying that um, a small percentage of their prey is, is pets, is, um, in this example, is a cat. And uh, it doesn't seem to be the adult eagles that are the main contributor of this conflict. It really does look like it's the juveniles that are being evicted early um, without a lot of hunting experience. And they come into the suburbs and they maybe confuse or find um, cats and small dogs equivalent to most of their normal prey, um, like hyrax, monkeys, and small carnivores like mongooses. 
And uh, just a quick story about uh, climbing up into these nest trees. Some of these eucalypt trees are 65 meters tall and the nests are anywhere from 20 to 40 meters up into these gum trees. So um, I've heard in the past uh, many a story about crowned eagles attacking climbers. And in the first instance, Leslie Brown, um, the, who did the very first and major research on crowned eagles in Kenya and East Africa. So I burdened myself with a riot helmet and a backpack full of padding to try and protect myself. Um, after Leslie's photos here, then I also worked with Simon, who also uh, shared many stories about being attacked by crowned eagles near the nest. And in each of these photos, 20 to 30 years between them, I've also been attacked once or twice. But uh, considering I've climbed um, possibly 100, 150 times to various nests around the city, um, being attacked a, a handful of times is really quite a small amount. So as well as uh, some of the conflict with the juvenile eagles, um, we've also found uh, juvenile eagles um, are really um, have a very risky early few years in their life. We've been trying to track some of them and we've found that, for example, this crowned eagle was electrocuted on a um, power line above the railway line and collected by um, a local person who um, carried it back to their village and it ended up being sold to a sangoma um, and prepared for uh, muti, for uh, traditional belief-based medicine. Um, so this is one of the, the impacts on crowned eagles. Um, Definitely persecution and, and being shot is another um, cause. And what we don't know is the degree and extent of impact of electrocutions. And we've also found collisions with some of the security fencing and with mirrored glass seem to also be uh, quite a, a risky situation for crowned eagles in the city. Um, so we would like to continue on with our research into a specific area of uh, GPS tracking so we can see how they move amongst the landscape, how they maybe adjust their schedule to avoid busy periods where people are in the reserves and the parks and uh, figure out where they are hunting and where they're moving. And if we do find injuries and mortalities, we can try and find ways to uh, mitigate these um, effects. And we also feel very strongly that um, it's really up to the community to be custodians of the crowned eagles and of the raptors and to know and, and enjoy their presence and to understand all these challenges that the crowned eagles have in their lives. So we try and get um, as many people involved whenever we're attaching the ID rings. Um, we give them um, the names that the community choose for the crowned eagles and we try and um, relay all that information back to them about the crowned eagles life story. Yeah, and with that, we are actually coming to an end from this little overview already. I hope it was possible to convince you how amazing and diverse urban raptors really are from the little ones to the big ones who is my favorite it's probably not a secret and who is Shane's is probably not a secret either but we are passionate about all of them and we are always happy to have an opportunity to talk to them uh, to talk to them as well oh my god <laughs> to talk about them um, and with that we thank you so much for this lovely invitation I never knew about Shia Screen Africa I have to admit and I googled it and I'm a huge fan ever since and have been watching so many episodes and it's been an absolute blast and it has been so much fun to prepare that and yeah we are really happy that we are welcome in the community and we are happy to talk about urban raptors thank you <laughs> fantastic thank you so much guys um yeah your your passion uh for not only raptors but specifically urban raptors definitely shows through and is quite um um 
yeah, it's quite evident, really, and and, and it's uh, inspiring. So thank you again for uh, for sharing your experiences and uh, and all your research. And uh, stick uh, stick by. Uh, everyone that has questions, I'm sure there are going to be fun, uh, quite a lot of questions. We will open the floor up to uh, the audience at the end of this uh, of this session. So it's on now to Kaka Carlson, who's going to also talk to us a little bit more about urban birds. I'm sure the majority of you who live or have been in Africa have seen a yellowbill kite. Because the yellowbill kite is actually one of Africa's most common and abundant raptor species. The green color on the map shows the yellowbill kite's distribution range, which is more or less the whole of Africa south of the Sahara. What struck me the most the first time I was in Nigeria in 2021 was the sheer number of yellowbill kites we observed. And still, so little is known about this raptor species. It's known to be an intra-African migrant, but exactly where it's migrating is poorly understood. In my recollection, only one study has previously looked into the movement pattern of the yellowbill kite. That study was from South Africa and included one individual. That individual migrated from South Africa to Uganda before it migrated back to South Africa. But what about the kites in Nigeria? Where are they migrating to? That's what I wanted to find out. Hey everyone, I'm Kaka. I'm doing my master's program at Lund University. And for my master's thesis, I'm studying the movement pattern of the yellowbill kite in Nigeria. And I'm doing that in collaboration with AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute and the Nius University. So why don't we get to know the yellowbill kite a little bit better? Yellowbill kite is a medium-sized raptor with a wingspan of 130 to 155 centimeters. This bird is known to be connected to humans and human habitats. In Nigeria, where I've been working, we found kites everywhere from cities to farmlands. Yellowbill kite is also known to, to be what we call a generalist feeder, which means they feed on a variety of items. For instance, they can hunt prey themselves, and they can prey on everything from small mammals, lizards and chickens to invertebrates. In coastal areas, they are known to catch fish. They also scavenge, for example, on road kills. What is known about this species is the gathering of many individuals by the initiation of migration. It is possible to see so many of them flying together. I'm going to tell you a story. The story is called Challenges and Knowledge Gained in the Field Working with the Yellowbill Kites. In order to investigate the Yellowbill Kites' movement pattern, we need to capture a few individuals and fit them with GPS transmitters. An easy task, one might think, considering this species is so abundant and it's occurring so close to us humans. Let's see how that went. On a farm located south in Nigeria, we encountered so many yellowbill kites on a field together with cattle aggregates. We mounted a trapping cage where we intended to capture the kites. Indeed, the birds were attracted to the cage and we saw so many flying around it. We were so excited. But suddenly one kite took off, then the next one, and before we knew it, all kites were gone. Hmm. Plan B. We set up mist nets in the vicinity of the field where the kites and cattle aggregates were feeding. Then we waited. Suddenly both species took off. To our surprise, something got trapped in the net. We rushed there and we saw this guy, a cattle aggregate. That's the wrong species. We relocated to a place where the kites have been known to roost at night. Again, we mounted the mist nets in the evening before the kites came in, but nothing. But early in the morning, we suddenly saw something moving in the net. A barn owl. At least a bird of prey, so we are getting closer. 
we moved on to the next plan and tried a local trap. And that was successful. If you wanted to capture grey kestrels. What we did experience was that the yellow-billed kite is a very clever bird and very cautious about its surroundings. Meanwhile, we tried the different capturing methods. We had been climbing trees and checking nests for juveniles to tag. The challenge was to time our presence with the age of the nestlings, because we can't tag two small juveniles when they look something like this, because then the tag will just crush them. The need to have developed an adult plumage in order to support the tag, meaning they must be close to fledglings. Luckily, this story ended well. And we managed to tag four yellowbill kites, three juveniles and one adult. What I want to stress here is that sometimes field work can be very stressful, but you must be consistent and endure, and eventually it will pay off. Maybe some of you are now thinking, how do you tag a bird with a GPS transmitter? I'm going to try to explain. First, we need a Teflon harness that will fit the GPS transmitter on the bird as a backpack. The Teflon harness goes on both sides of the bird's head. The two ends then cross on the stomach of the bird. Thereafter, they go on the back of the wings before the Teflon harness get attached to the GPS transmitter on the bird's back with help of some metal clips. Now I think it's time to look into where the yellow bill kites that we tied in Nigeria are migrating to. We followed them for a year and found two different migratory trajectories. The trajectories we are seeing here are from two of the juveniles and the green dot represents the natal nest. These individuals initiated their migration in the middle of June and flew to northeastern Nigeria and southern Niger before the back migration started at the end of October. The interesting thing here is that one of these individuals, the one to the right, flew to the neighboring country Benin before we lost contact with it in the middle of December last year. The other kind of trajectory seen for the remaining two individuals is a circular trajectory. These birds migrated firstly to eastern Nigeria, thereafter they continued to southern Niger before they flew through the western part of Nigeria on their migration back. The adult's trajectory, which is seen on the map to the right, migrated back to the area where it was tagged the previous year. What is also interesting about these trajectories is the different number of stationary areas the individuals are utilizing during their migration. I have highlighted these areas within the blue circles. The first two individuals on the top occupied one stationary area each during migration, whereas the adult to the lower right utilized two stationary areas during migration and the last juvenile down to the left utilized as many as four stationary areas during its migratory path. It seems like the yellow bill kite is not just a flexible feeder. It also seems to exhibit a flexible migratory behavior and that makes this bird very interesting to study. All right, perfect. Um, now it's over to East Africa to visit with Washington Washira uh, to talk about urban raptors in Kenya. Welcome to Nairobi, Kenya's economic and political capital. As the day breaks, we begin to realize just how busy the city life gets on a daily basis. Often referred to as the green city in the sun, this place is indeed a warm paradise. It is one of the few places on earth where you have a national park at the edge of the city.
My name is Washington Washira, and this is a story of Nairobi's most vulnerable occupants. I will take you through a journey into the lives of Nairobi's top avian predator, learning about their lives, their struggles, their successes, and how they are making life work in a metropolis. Welcome to the world of African crowned eagles. The African crowned eagle is the most powerful eagle in Africa. It is the largest forest dependent raptor across the continent. And I've been very lucky to work with and study this species that is arguably the top eagle of Africa. To me, this species has a name that it deserves. They indeed do wear a crown. I personally like to call the Nairobi pairs that I work with the urban crowns. Let us take a look at the life of an African crowned eagle. Life basically starts at the nest. Nests are huge, built on large trees, and parents keep adding sticks and branches regularly. The parents dedicate their time to incubating and protecting the eggs. And only one chick is raised per nest. Chick hatching times vary across regions depending on individual pairs. The chicks are rather white and this makes it easy for the parents to locate them when they get lost in the forest. Having different markings from the adults also reduces chances of being viewed as a threat to the territorial adults. In fact, some chicks have been observed to roam in territories belonging to adults that aren't their own parents. Even funnier, some chicks beg and get fed by neighboring adults. After about four years, the chicks are big enough to live an adult life. Eagles and human beings have coexisted for centuries, and in fact, African crowned eagles are believed to have contributed to the evolution of man. I have learned a lot working with eagles for the past three years, but one of my teachers, raptor biologist Simon Thompson, has worked with these eagles across Africa for decades. So I paid him a visit to hear his perspectives towards these eagles and therefore compare his experiences with my experience from Nairobi. The crowned eagle to me is a very special bird, not because it's big and it's powerful, yeah. because it's intelligent. And I've had, I think, 27 crowned eagles for rehab. And given the fact that they probably evolved us, yeah. and you've got to be smart to predate upon higher apes. So out of all the world's animals, yeah. the thing that predates on monkeys probably has to be the smartest. Crowned eagles are known to eat a varied composition of prey. Sometimes, the mere size of their prey species is phenomenal. My observations in Nairobi are quite similar to observations made by Simon across Africa. They kill yeah. things like antelope. Yes. Um, Basically, the majority of their prey is things like uh, Irax, yeah. monkeys, uh -huh. diker, dick dick, yeah. Sunni, um, a lot of small carnivores uh -huh. like uh, mongoose, jenna cats, yeah. palm civets. Uh -huh. they're, they're pretty eclectic eaters. Yeah. Uh, they don't eat much in the way of birds, although mm -hmm. they can occasionally take things like um, forest uh, guinea fowl, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Uh, but they can, on occasion, kill animals over a, a hundred pounds, over 35 kg. And wow. I've seen a female uh -huh. uh, take a full-grown female in parlor very easily, as though it was nothing, like it was taking a rabbit. Sometimes we see them there a little too far, but success seems inevitable, even when swallowing a full Sunni leg. In order to hunt such formidable prey items, a predator like this requires a great set of weaponry. And yes, none has better killing tools than the African crowned eagle. Um, they have the largest killing implement on the African continent. Uh -huh. That hind talon there yes. is bigger than a lion's tooth. <laughs> the muscle on his legs uh -huh. is huge. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Avian muscle is much mm -hmm. 
more efficient than mammal. Yeah. And when you look at the amount of muscle mass on that, mm -hmm. it's bigger than that on a hyena's skull. <laughs> wow. But one of the other things is you look at the physiology of the leg. Mm -hmm. That leg, the tarsus there, is called the cannon bone uh -huh. in Old English. Yes. It has a rotating sort of crest uh -huh. that goes along the ridge there, separating tendons. Yeah. No other eagle has that, except for the uh -huh. harpy, which is an odd, um, very strange. Uh -huh. <laughs> example of parallel evolution. Yes. So that also takes a lot of impact because it ah. the bone is rotated okay. so it can actually be crushed and hit mm. a lot stronger than a an other bird of prey's bone nice. without yeah. fracturing. Okay. Uh, and the females mm -hmm. are massive compared to the male. Yeah. So they actually divide their food, they divide their resources between the okay. male and the female. <laughs> Males taking the smaller uh -huh. and the females capable of taking the much larger. Um, other physiological adaptations mm -hmm. would include a very deep eyebrow. So uh, you can see he has a very, very deep eyebrow. Yeah. So he can take a lot of punishment by going yeah. straight through thickets without, you know, uh, harming his eyeballs. The main eyeballs. Ah, okay. Other eagles may not have that incredibly deep yeah. ridge. Um, he's also, as you can see, mm -hmm. he looks forward. Mm -hmm. So that means he has to compromise a bit on his bill, yeah. which is then more laterally compressed. Uh -huh. Crowned eagles are special in Nairobi and their existence here is very crucial. They play a huge role in maintaining a balance in the entire urban ecosystem. Being at the top of the food chain means that these eagles help to regulate the populations of their prey. And they are a great indicator of forest health in Nairobi. Because having a crowned eagle mm -hmm. tells you a lot that the integrity of the forest is quite well and, in, and intact. True, true. Eagles are charismatic, and having Africa's most powerful eagle in your city is such a nice bonus. But the story of these eagle species in Nairobi is by far not perfect, and they're in more danger than we think. They can take goats and they can take sheep. Uh -huh. And uh, on occasion, well, a lot yeah. of occasions, they get persecuted for yeah. that. Sometimes they are overthrown by competing species and driven from their nests. And once in a while, they do receive a beating from their own food sources. The species is currently classified as near threatened by the IUCN, a global authority on species conservation status. However, these eagles are more endangered than we mostly perceive. I think we also need to accept that at the national level, it is critically endangered. Yeah. Uh, and have it uplisted to critically endangered. However, Nairobi is transforming rapidly with pressure to build multi-lane highways, bypasses, windmills, power lines, and upcoming mega homes. Nairobi residents do not want to lose these eagles neither. And one of the enthusiasm that I created was the crown eagle. I would really love to see these crowned eagles live long for my children to see them and maybe become enthusiasts like me. Interestingly, since I started my work in the year 2015, at least five pairs of crowned eagles have been known to occur in the green spaces of the greater Nairobi region. In fact, this Nairobi population is one of the best known in eagle history. It's one of the oldest uh, known groups of eagles anywhere in the world, going back to about 1936. Yeah. Actually, Leslie Brown used to boast that it was the best known eagle in the world. Wow. Back in the, even mm -hmm. the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. Uh, Kenya actually led the world when it came around to mm -hmm. eagle knowledge. Okay. Um, through the work of Leslie. Uh -huh. Protection of natural forests by the Kenya Forest Service has played a huge role in ensuring suitable habitat for the species. Partners working with the Kenya Forest Service, such as the local community forest associations, have been very supportive to the conservation of these forests. By conserving these wonderful eagles, we will transform Nairobi as a model green city that has a national park at its doorstep, where one can see predators like lions, and now avian predators like crowned eagles. This will make it possible for tourism to thrive in the city, with attractions like crowned eagles being top of the wish lists of many visitors. From beautiful trees, waterfalls, rivers, dams, and scenic caves, these forests form beautiful green spaces where people come to relax and take a walk far from the loud city, 
The green spaces also help to form water catchments for our rivers, filter our dirty water in the city, and freshen the air we breathe. And here, the eagles thrive in an urban paradise. The, the crowned eagles there yeah. should in many ways become, say, the emblem mm -hmm. of, say, the Kenya Forest Service, or the emblem, you know, literally have it on their hat. Yeah. Um, really, eagles and people can yeah. live side by side. True, true, true. He's trying to, yeah. <laughs> Naughty boy. <laughs> As I go home tonight, I pray that these eagles live long enough within my city for my children to enjoy them someday. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Washington and Simon, for that insight into crowned eagles in Kenya, in Nairobi, well, Nairobi Kenya specifically. Um, right, we've come to that time of the night where we're going to open up the floor to our audience to chat to us a little bit about um, their own experiences with raptors, um, or if they have any questions in particular. Um, if you have a question for any of our panelists, please go ahead. You can ask it live. Um, if you would like to ask it live, just hit the reaction button and use the raise hand um, option, and we will um, we will get to you there. If you do not want to ask it live, you're welcome to type in your question into the chat, um, and then we'll we'll read through the questions as we go along. I think we had the first question was from Eric uh, wanting to know, uh, I assume this is for Shane, how often uh, how often do you monitor your crowned eagles? And then he also wants to know what is the lifespan and uh, of these crowned eagles and how long do they incubate? Uh, I guess I, my project started in 2012 and I lived um, in Durban for eight years. Uh, the breeding season, there is a season in South Africa because it's quite seasonal um, and high latitude. So I would monitor the early nest building from July onwards until chicks were all fledged in February. So that's an eight month long breeding season. And I would check nests uh, every two to three weeks during nest building until incubation and right through until the nest had failed or fledged. Um, then we moved to Austria and then there was the unforeseen pandemic. So only last year and this year am I coming back to do shorter, more intense um, two to three month um, survey periods. And uh, what was the other one? How long do they incubate? Um, 49 to 52 days on the, on the eggs depending on whether there's one or two eggs and exactly how long um, they were, they started the incubation. And then uh, we know of several crowned eagles in captivity that are at least uh, 30 years old. I think one of the birds that Simon has um, at the Kenya Bird of Prey Trust is approaching 50 years perhaps. And, um, but both of his birds that have lived well over 40 years had medical um, operations that would have been problematic for them to survive in the wild. So whether there's um, issues when the birds reach about 30 years in the wild and they get um, eye issues and various things, maybe 30 years is a good lifespan for a wild crowned eagle. All right. All right. Thanks for that, uh, Shane. I see Marty. Marty, you had your hand raised and I see Jared, you've got your hand raised as well. We'll get to you after Marty. Marty, please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. How's the guys? Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I see uh, from what you were saying, you based, were based in uh, Maritzburg and as a Joburg, uh, Joburgite, I suppose we call ourselves. I'm very jealous of uh, you guys not uh, us not having crowned eagles in in town, um. So I'm just in, in, interested. What would prevent them occurring in a place like Joburg? I mean, they say that we're the largest man-made forest in I think the world. I don't know if that's a true um sort of urban legend that goes around Joburg. 
but we also have a lot of um, uh, hardy dars and possible other prey species. I don't want to mention pets too too loudly, but um, I, I'm just intrigued. Will will the crowned eagles actually ever expand their territory to include a place like Johannesburg? I really share your feeling. I have been living in Cape Town and I was also wondering why are they not there? Because when I moved to South Africa, I heard about the urban crowned eagles and I didn't realize how big South Africa is. <laughs> I was very naive <laughs> to move there. And yes, we don't have them either, but Shane is the expert who might uh, have an answer for us. Yeah, we had uh, interesting sighting of a juvenile or a sub-adult arrive in Bloemfontein and I'm not sure what the current um, status. It was there in Bloemfontein for a couple of years. You're right, um, Johannesburg is one of the largest urban forests in a non-forest biome. So it's supposed to be high grassland. And there are plenty of, um, plenty of opportunities um, because of that, but it is drier than crowned eagles typically live in. I do wonder, yeah, with the urban monkeys um, and what other sort of base abundance of prey they would need to, to establish a population and how much um, green space they would need and how little disturbance they would need. So there's some thresholds that all need to come together to allow crowned eagles to occupy any one territory. But crowned eagles... Um, in their natural, pristine forest environments have naturally extremely small territories, somewhere around 6.5 to 10 square kilometers for territories. And that is also true in Durban, um, also true in other South African cities and, and also Nairobi, I think as well. Very small territories compared to Marshall Eagles, which are similar size, but need 100 or more square kilometers per territory. So um, yeah, it's an interesting question. What are those um, minimum thresholds for disturbance, for um, forest and for um, um, prey resources that would allow crowned eagles to occupy Johannesburg? Mm -hmm. And it also comes so, down to the distribution, right? So if you are you have a city with a great of um, resources, you still need a, a kind of a corridor of suitable habitat for them to get there. So that could be yeah. another reason to exclude an animal from a certain area, that there's just no way of getting there. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so I think the second, sort of second part of what I was going to ask is, if, and I'm not suggesting that it should be done, but if a... Um, pair or a couple of crowned eagles were actually released in an area, do you think they would actually survive um, in, in Joburg? Or do you think it would be, um, you know, uh, is, is there a temperature issue or, <clears throat> as you said, just too much activity um, that would disturb them? I tend to think sometimes it's a humidity and water issue. Some species prefer certain amount of rainfall, um, whether it's high or low. Um, sort of desert adapted species or rainforest adapted species. I think if there was an artificial situation where birds were um, found to be in an area, they might be able to um, eke out an existence perhaps. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, grounds for establishing a population. Um, and I would think there's a huge amount of groundwork that would need to be done to get an enormous number of citizens on board to establish crowned eagles in Johannesburg, because you're, well, you know, that's a fight against all of this persecution <laughs> and, and misconceptions that, that is inevitable. No, awesome. Thanks for answering my question. I, I think that would possibly help with a ma major rat problem that we have in certain areas in Joburg, but the, I think the owls are also busy with that. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, that, um, that's a good point. And, and spotted eagle owls, we haven't mentioned owls, but spotted eagle owls are extraordinary urban adapters. And there is a big owl box project in uh, Johannesburg, Pretoria. Um, so yeah, that I don't know how, how linked it is to, pub I haven't seen publications or whether there's linked to researchers, but um, spotted eagle owls are doing a massive job to keep rodent numbers 
um, down in urban environments. Thanks for that, Shane and Petra, and thanks, Marty, for that question. Uh, Jared, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a your question? Thanks. Hello, wonderful presentations all round. Uh, my question is, are are there any cases in uh, your the eagle evictions where they evict birds from nests of different species? Uh, good question. It's a different um, uh, framing of, of um, part of my research, and I didn't want to delve too deeply into it. But uh, there is some work that we are building up a um, database for about all the different interspecies interactions. And we have quite a lot. We have um, nests that are originally built by black sparrowhawks that are then occupied by crowned eagles. We have nests built by black uh, crowned eagles that are then occupied by black sparrowhawks. Um, sometimes fish eagles get involved with different um, interspecies interactions. And we mentioned how um, Egyptian geese are really strong competitors of black sparrowhawks in Cape Town. And they are also strong competitors for nests in crowned eagles as well. And they will challenge crowned eagles. They will um, get in earlier in the season and occupy a nest before the crowned eagles have established that their nest and their um, breeding regime. And so crowned eagles sometimes will build an alternative nest because the bully geese are in the way. And uh, likewise, we've also had crowned eagles that, that kill the geese that are trying to occupy a nest. So it's very complex, um, but there are a lot of interesting dynamics going on there. And we didn't mention one very important thing where my little powerful kestrels come in, <laughs> <laughs> because falcons in general are not able to build their own nests. So they need to find structures where they can lay eggs that can be a nest box, that can be a natural cliff, or they steal the nest from somebody else and they are very, very good at it. So the kestrels are often stealing the nest from corvids, and so it's also for the um, peregrine falcons when they are on the cliffs that they are sometimes stealing nests from others but the kestrels are really notorious thieves and I always find it very funny at the beginning of the breeding season when I get so many phone calls of upset citizens that the um, the poor um, the poor kestrel is getting chased by by crows and I'm just like they are actually not poor they are trying to steal the nest from the crow and they are just defending their own resource. But the perception is the cashier is the good one, the crow is the bad one. So it must be the other way around. And that's really repeating itself every single year. And it's quite impressive because they are tiny, right? But they have attitude and they really drive them out. So that's just part of their breeding cycle that they steal a nest from somebody else. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that question there, Jared. Uh, we have a question from Mum. Uh, what can humans do to encourage crowned eagles to nest in their gardens? <laughs> I saw that. And my first reaction is, I think it's problematic to have a nest in gardens. We do have those situations and we need more data. But it's my perception that a juvenile that fledges in a garden is far too used to people that it inevitably has a lower survival as soon as it has to leave its parents' territory. So in the forest adjacent to um, houses, the further away they are, they, the more sort of um, cautious they are about being close to people. And, and we also stress really uh, one of the main jobs that we have in Durban is to stress to people to not provide food to juveniles. The parents are looking after them, and part of looking after them is to give them periods of fasting and reduce food so that the juveniles learn how to hunt and make it on their own. So when a juvenile is begging and screaming for two or three days, some people will sometimes offer food to that eagle. And the only thing that results from that is the eagle associates gardens with food. And in the future, that's a really bad story outcome for that eagle. 
All right. Thanks for that, Shane. Uh, I see Eric has his hand raised. Uh, if you have a question, Eric, please uh, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. I don't think Eric can. I think he's having trouble with his, uh, his sound, but I see he's asked a question below. How often do they feed? Sorry. We haven't followed eagles in the wild per se. We've watched them plenty at the nest and with cameras, but following them around their sort of wintering movements and movement away from the, the nest is very, very difficult. I would say um, without too much grounds to back it up, that they would eat once a day um, and fill up their crop, and then they would process that food every day. Um, for, for hunting large, large prey, they are very well known to dissect their prey into pieces that they can carry away. So if they're killing maybe a 15, 20 kilogram animal, then they will cut one to two kilogram pieces and stash them and feed on them until those pieces are rotten. So in summer, that can be three or four days they can feed on one large animal. Um, in winter, it could be five or more days that they will gorge several days in a row and then they can last for maybe five or more days without a meal if they have um, bad luck hunting. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Shane. Eric, I see uh, you are unmuted. I think uh, because you have your headphones on, um, it's not working when you speak. So you might have to unplug your headphones when you want to uh, ask the question. All right. I, I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, we can't hear you, unfortunately. All right. Perfect. So let's uh, let's move on there. Uh, the next question was from Ben. Do you have cases where more people moving into cities make it hard for birds, uh, birds of prey to find food? So their numbers in cities went down. Yeah, that's actually the story for most species. So it's um, we don't have scenarios where there was a city and suddenly there were more people in the city and the raptors disappeared. But if a city comes up, then many disappear. Many can't sustain in this highly urbanized area, which is sealed surface area, low productivity, low food usually, lots of disturbance. And then they are just disappearing and moving, moving out of that place that was built up basically. So that's what we call an urban avoider. And most raptor species are in that, that category, basically. So when we think of, um, in, in Europe, it would be the, the golden eagle. They are not appearing in cities, right? They completely disappeared from cities. We have, same with the wedge-tailed eagles in Australia. We have the, well, various eagle is a little bit of a special case, as Kaylin knows, because there are some that are, fairly close to urban environments, but they are not hunting in the city. It's not like an urban crowned eagle. They are just taking advantage of a cliffside that happened to be in an urbanized area. So the Table Mountain also hosts a pair of Varus eagle, and we have um, some close to uh, Pretoria as well. So, so that's where, if there is a resource that they can use, yes, but if it's completely highly built up and just sealed and disturbed and artificial light at night and traffic and so on, most of them can't sustain. One of the main um, species that were, or group of species that was harmed in our analysis of Australian raptors were wetland raptors. Because in the cities, um, generally, you're uh, reducing the amount of wetlands, you're sealing up all the rivers and into canals and moving that water through the system. So there becomes very little wetland habitats for um, species like swamp harriers and, and other wetland species. All right, thanks for that, guys. Uh, the next question is, uh, let me make sure I get the right one. I think it's called, I think it's Diodine, oh, I think it is. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, what is the average number of eggs crowned eagles can lay? 
and at what age can they start laying eggs? Can all can also uh, can you also elaborate uh, more on their nests, the average size, materials, and how long it can take a crowned eagle to build a nest? Yeah, sure. Um, the average number must be somewhere slightly under two eggs. Um, I've never heard of a crowned eagle nest with three eggs. Um, it's typical to have two eggs in a nest. Um, sometimes only one, and often only one nest, one chick will hatch. But when two chicks do hatch, it's it's within five to seven days that the smallest, weakest of the chicks um, does not survive. So. Um, at what age can they start laying eggs? Now, Simon's talk um, presented the information that um, crowned eagles reach maturity at around five to six years old. And that's when they have their last um, sub-adult molt into an adult stage. And what's really interesting about my observations and doing these um, identification rings in Durban is that we have one record of a three-year-old part partnering up with a male and laying eggs. Um, the eggs did not hatch. And the second year, so she was four years old, she did hatch chicks, but then she failed to raise them to fledge or raise it to fledge. Uh, we also had two others that were nesting at four years old. So um, they're physiologically capable of raising chicks at four years old. Um, whether they're able at three years old is still um, up for debate. Whether those eggs were fertile or infertile is um, still a question that we don't know. Um, so generally, crowned eagles have some of the largest nests of, of any eagle. Um, perhaps Varro's eagles in sheltered nest sites um, under cliffs can build those nests up many meters right up until the shelf and the roof of their chosen nest site. Uh, so crowned eagles will spend anywhere from um, two weeks to two or three months adding material to their nest. And that forms stratified layers um, so that, you know, these branches will decay over several years and just powder and fall out the bottom of the nest. Um, on some of our nest cameras that um, cover the period in dawn and dusk, you see late in the breeding season uh, a migration of millipedes into the nest to eat all of the leaf and, and old detritus in the nest. So those eagles do need to add new material every year to build up their nest site and it keeps breaking away at the bottom um, in a, in a never-ending cycle. Um, the materials that they're using, they start their nest building with um, dry branches, which they can either pluck with their bill off um, nearby trees or grab hold of the branch and hang upside down until they pull the branch off. Some of these branches are incredibly long, like um, three, sometimes four meters long. They carry them down from a slope down onto the nest and they can land very clumsily onto the nest and spend hours trying to shuffle this massive branch into the right, the perfect place that they want to continue with. Um, and then in the last week or so, they'll add a lot of fresh green leaves to form the cup where they will lay their eggs. Um, yeah, um, the shortest we've had a crowned eagle build one is uh, just two weeks onto an artificial platform. They were trying to build a nest that was never getting underway on a natural site. And so we added a couple of pieces of timber into the same fork and they quickly built a very, very rushed nest and laid eggs within two weeks. But they are gigantic, these nests, because that's one of the main memories that I actually have when I started climbing nests for Shane's project, that it's so hard to get around this, this nest. I mean, you are hanging in the tree and you're suddenly trying to maneuver about this huge obstacle that is just in the middle. And once you are in there, you just disappear. Even he in his size disappears in there easily. You don't, you, you can really just hide a human nicely in the nest. It's huge. <laughs> it's big. 
ground eagles don't hide humans in their nests. Yeah, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> Another yeah, thing. that's that's uh that's true. Very large nests, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and do do you find them in? Sorry, this is a added on to that question: is do you find them in, um, in specific trees? You mentioned you know blue gums are, are very important for them. Or do you find them to, you know selecting specific species, um, over others? Yeah, it's hard to say what they select in terms of um, in relation to availability. But large eucalyptus trees grow very fast, and there's many more of them than many of the other indigenous trees um, in the metropolitan green space. So 60% of the nests are in eucalyptus, and then about 10% are in pine trees, and the other 30% are in a, a big variety of indigenous trees, ficus sur, some other fig trees. Um, their main indigenous tree species are um, Trichilia drigiana, natal forest mahogany, and Macaranga capensis, I think it is, uh, river Macaranga. Those are the main two species that they prefer uh, indigenous trees in Durban. Um, yeah, F- further up on the um, Mpumalanga escarpment and into East Africa, there's a whole different biome of, of tree species for them to select. And um, yeah, uh, my my bot- botanical knowledge is not um, that great. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shane. Um, I see Eric has another question. He wants to know whether... Um, could they, well, what could their greatest predator be? I guess, are oh, you talking about crowned eagles, uh, Eric? Yeah, mm. what, what, what's the greatest predator for crowned eagles? And are there any diseases which affect birds of prey? I'm going to stretch it a bit by saying it's a predator, but um, the greatest threat to a crowned eagle, I think, is another crowned eagle, um, especially in areas where they are living at these high densities. We are collecting more and more information about territorial combat, including eagles that have killed other eagles and are eating them. Um, Which is very common for large uh, eagles. I mean, that's not something unique to the crown eagles. It's not unique to crown eagles, even um, pygmy falcons. Yeah, yeah. Territorial Um, dispute for an adult raptor is quite a typical cause of major injury or even death. Yeah. Yeah, where they are just fighting for territories. And uh, yeah, diseases um, affect a very large variety of birds of prey. Um, black sparrow hawks and peregrines will catch trichomoniasis from the pigeons um, that they're hunting. And there's um, pox viruses that are specific to rap- raptors. Um, the Mauritius kestrel is heavily harmed by um, the Mauritius pox virus. And uh, bird flu, is there's a concern now that uh, raptors are going to be harmed by the bird flu um, spread. And there are these mites that the um, black sparrowhawks are getting actually from the chickens that they sometimes prey on. Um, so they, these are mites that are going into the legs, those are at the head, and they're losing all the feathers and they're getting lesions it, and, and it's all necrotic. It looks horrible. It looks really like they are suffering a lot. But somehow they survive it, and then you just have all these scar tissues and the remaining bolt. So they are often looking like tiny vultures. Um, and we often get pictures of those birds because people struggle in identifying them for, for a good reason. But we also have lots of records that they are still successfully breeding and so on. They are they are badass. I mean, raptors in general, they survive things that are hard to imagine. And we had a black sparrow hawk in Cape Town, a male who lost his leg, we think in a snare, and he was breeding successfully for three more seasons with one leg. We don't even understand how he was copulating, how he was mating with one leg and raising chicks um, as the sole hunter in the family. Absolutely impressive. They are really hardcore in what they can survive. And I should prompt you to talk about um, blood parasites in kestrels. Well, blood parasites, that's the main thing as well, right? I mean, they, they can host um, like avian malaria, but it's um, just sister groups of them. Blood parasites like plasmodium, leucocytosoan, hemoproteus, these are all little one-cell 
um, parasites that are living in the blood cycle. And once they are positive, they will remain positive for the rest of their, li their life. And depending on how good they are with the immune system, it, co it flames up like malaria in humans as well, very similar in that way. So they have phases where they are sicker and then they have phases where they are bitter again. Um, and it's something that usually in raptors don't kill them, but they just carry that with and they get it from all kind of um, biting midges, black flies and mosquitoes. So they are often getting these vector borne diseases as well. Yeah. Okay. I can think of, not really. These are the main ones, I would say. Uh, I mean, obviously, they have lots of gut parasites and so on as well. I mean, all, all and, and ectoparasites that are just um, the lysis and um, louse flies, lots of them that are feeding on them. So, but the the real big diseases, I think, are the ones we mentioned. Yeah, I think that's something we don't actually look too much into. We don't think about too much is is uh, diseases and parasites and birds of prey, right? Um, so very, very definitely a very interesting um, part of birds of prey. Um, I, I mean, think... there is lots of literature from from the falconry side of things, right? I mean, there are many, many people who hold these birds in captivity or for for falconry purposes that are mm. training with these birds, and they need to be fit and healthy in order to hunt, of course. So there is a lot of raptor health care and different diseases and parasite treatments in that area with the veterinary side that I'm just not not um, familiar with too much. So, yeah. Of course, of course. Simon would know. He knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Simon always, always has something interesting. He always has an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Always has an answer. We, we we look forward to it every time he's online. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we will end off the night with the last question from Janet. Um, she wants to know what is the reason for the early eviction of juveniles from the nests in Durban? Yes. Uh yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I'm still looking into it, and I'm only speculating here, but I believe that. The spring abundance of Hardida ibis nestlings. So it was a great revelation to us using the nest cameras to discover so many Hardida ibis nestlings being fed to the chicks. Hardida ibis have really exploited the urban parkland and golf course, um, irrigated gardens. Um, these these wet soils that Harida can get access to. They were a protected species. They still are a protected species from when in the 1960s they were incredibly rare. And their numbers have absolutely exploded. Now, they breed um, independently in pairs scattered throughout in uh, the, the forest canopy throughout Durban in really rubbish nests. And <laughs> sorry, Hardy does. But, um, but there's many an observation from locals who say a crowned eagle came through their garden. They flew into uh, the tree that the Hardy does are nesting. The male looked at the nest and said, okay, there's chicks. And then exactly two weeks later, he came back right on time when the chicks were a good um, half a kilo morsel. Uh, collected those chicks and flew back to the nest to feed his, his own chick. So with the abundance of Harida ibis and rock hyrax, I believe maybe the crowned eagle parents are making a decision saying, this juvenile is going to have an abundance of easy food in spring. If I kick it out now and put effort into another chick, we can maximize our productivity. Uh, whereas in natural environments where hunting monkeys is their primary food source and monkeys are incredibly hard to catch and risky to catch, they have to develop strategies over a very long period of time. Maybe the crowned eagles decide that this juvenile really does need 12 months of care and hunting experience before it will even survive being um, away from its parents. So. That's perhaps the balance between uh, annual breeding and biennial breeding. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. 
Um, and with that, everyone, I would like to say thank you to our speakers for taking the time out to come and chat to us about uh, your work. It is uh, very, very interesting and extremely uh, insightful. So thank you for, for that, uh, Petra and Shane and Kaka. Thank you for um, for joining us. Um, for everyone, uh, I would like to invite you to join us next week again, same time, same place, 7 o'clock South African time. Uh, we have a, a very, very exciting talk by Dr. Tim Mackerel. He's going to be speaking about migrations of ospreys into Africa from Europe. So do not miss it. It is going to be phenomenal. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, wish you guys a, a wonderful night, and I can't wait to see you all back here next week, Wednesday. Until then, cheers for now. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>